will take you through a short presentation about Mind Medicine Australia. Some of you may have seen this, um, but it's our standard practice just to make sure, because there's always new people on these, on these webinars that we do give a little background to the organisation. Then we'll welcome Alana and Renee, and they will speak about the certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies. There's also the chat screen, and we've also received some pre-registered questions for this seminar as well. So we will be answering those questions um, as soon as Renee and Alana finish talking about the, the certificate and, and find as much time as we can to answer any questions. So if we go to the first slide. And I just need to reiterate the point that we do not encourage or facilitate illegal use of psychedelics or plant medicines. We're focused on the clinical and legal use of these medicines. Um, and we do reserve the right to record and publish these webinars. So the reason why Peter and I are donating our time and, and money and resources to this important initiative is because we really want to help alleviate mental illness in Australia. So these statistics, which are just getting worse and worse, um, are a real concern for every one of us. If we're not suffering with mental illness ourselves, then someone we know is, or met, probably many people we know are, and most of the people on this call are therapists who are working with, you know, people who are struggling. And this, the current modalities are not um, helping get enough people better. So we have these alarming statistics, one in five Australian adults with a mental illness. This was before COVID and the bushfires. Um, Sorry, could we, could we please mute that, um, that microphone, thank you. Could we mute that microphone that we can hear? Is that you, Ilan? Could you mute that now? That's been done. Rupert, thank you. Me? So a number of experts have suggested that these figures will increase by at least 30% due to the current pandemic. And of course, before this pandemic, one in eight Australians were on antidepressants, one in four older adults. Massive increases in these statistics and children as young as five being given antidepressants and other psychiatric medications, which is truly alarming. One in two Australians will experience a mental illness in their lifetime. Next slide, please. So we're a registered charity. Our goal is to seek to broaden the treatment paradigm for medical practitioners and their patients. We're focused at the moment on medicinal psilocybin and MDMA, but there are a number of other psychedelic and plant medicines which also um, are being investigated for treatment of a range of conditions. Our goal is that these therapies become an integral part of the mental health system. That is, when you go to see your practitioner, that these Will be provided as a first line of treatment alongside other treatments such as psychotherapy, antidepressants and other pharmacotherapy medications. Our goal is that these medicines are accessible and affordable to all Australians in need. Next slide. So this is the situation that we're dealing with. There's been no improvement in treatment outcomes for the past 50 years. It's a major challenge for all of us. So really a lost 50 years. And we see these outcomes from current treatments. Only 35% of sufferers experience remission from either pharmacotherapy, which is primarily antidepressants, or psychotherapy. And of course, a number of patients relapse and there's many common side effects and some serious side effects of antidepressants. And the outcomes um, of treatments for PTSD are even worse and, and PTSD is even harder to treat as you would all appreciate. So more of the same approach is not going to solve the problem. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. 
so these are the particular medicines that we're focused on at the moment, medicinal psilocybin for depression and possibly OCD and addiction, uh, medicinal MDMA for PTSD and possibly addiction. The remarkable thing about these medicines is that they only require two to three dose sessions in combination with psychotherapy compared to conventional treatments, which often require a lifetime of not only medicines, but also a lifetime of ongoing treatment and a lifetime of thinking that people are, are not well, that there's a life sentence, that they're suffering from depression or PTSD. And this is something they're stuck with for the rest of their lives, where we now know that there is possible remission in many more cases available if these medicines become available. These medicines are also considered extremely safe in a medically controlled environment and they're non-addictive. And this is being borne out further by the fact that they're being used to treat addiction, not only alcohol addiction, but opioid and other drug addictions and also smoking addiction. Both have been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA in the USA to fast track the approval process. And this designation is only provided to medicines which are considered vastly superior to existing treatments. Next slide, please. So Mind Medicine Australia is focused on four key strategies. One of them is awareness and knowledge building, and this webinar series is part of that. So educating a diverse range of groups from practitioners through to politicians, through to the general public and other sectors. We run a range of different events, screenings. Uh, we have a major international medical summit, hopefully, which will take place in November, which we've sold over 350 tickets for. And if it has to be moved, then we will um, move it to early next year. But we're doing our very best to try and see how we can deliver this. We're also um, setting up state and regional chapters throughout Australia and New Zealand. And a number of people on this call are members of some of our chapters and we welcome you. And if you're in a region where we have a chapter, we welcome you to join that chapter. Or if you're in, a chap in, in an area where we don't have a chapter, you may wish to approach us about starting a chapter in your area. Obviously tonight is to talk about the, the professional development program led by Renee and um, with support from Alana and a steering committee. And we'll be talking extensively about that this evening. So I'm not gonna go into that further now. We're also looking at setting up an Asia Pacific Centre for Emerging Mental Health Therapies for applied research and development, development of supply chains and agribusiness, education of health and allied health and economic modelling. We're also looking at rollout strategies and you'll see there, of course, we're looking at preferred legal and ethical frameworks for these medicines. We also have a psychological support services program, which Alana will speak about tonight. Today is a significant day because we've finally um, submitted two applications for the rescheduling of psilocybin and MDMA to the TGA. It's a major piece of work. And in August, we will reach out to all of you because there'll be a public consultation phase. And we will certainly need all of your support to support um, these applications to the TGA and be way stronger than any dissenting voices that might be out there. Um, so we will definitely um, have a huge call to action. Um, I think in the second, I think late August is, and there's only a very short window for this consultation period um, of about four weeks. The other very exciting thing that some of you will not be familiar with is the very good news that two psychiatrists in New South Wales have put in SASB applications to the TGA for serious, uh, seriously ill patients of theirs who are suffering with complex PTSD and depression. One has put in an application for MDMA and another for um, psilocybin. And both of those applications were approved within a very short period of time for those psychiatrists. Uh, the only thing now is that we have the very strange anomaly that the federal, you know, regulatory body has approved these SASB applications. And um, 
we have two states in Australia, New South Wales and Queensland, that have strange anomalies and impediments in their state laws that mean that it's hard to bring those medicines into Queensland and New South Wales. So we're currently speaking to the Office of the Minister for Health in New South Wales, and we may need to speak to the AG in New South Wales as well, the Attorney General, to get that law changed. The reason for that law being uh, an impediment is that it's directed at recreational use, um, whereas of course this is focused at medical use. So as Simon Longstaff, our board director says, it's one of those um, unintended consequences of legislation that actually is causing harm to citizens by not allowing them to have access to these medicines. I should say though, that in all other states in Australia, um, if you're putting in applications for SASB through psychiatrists or, or specialist phys physicians for your patients, the pathway is much smoother than in New South Wales or Queensland. We will get those impediments removed in New South Wales and Queensland. Um, but in the interim, if there are, and I just noticed something coming across the chat screen about psychiatrists putting applications in Victoria and they're more likely to immediately start to be able to work with the medicines. Because obviously we also have enabled the medicines to come into Australia and be available as soon as these approvals occur so that patients who are in desperate need can get these medicines as soon as possible. So that's sort of where we're at. We've made a lot of progress in a year and a half. Uh, we're extremely proud of the team that we're working with here at My Medicine Australia. We have an exceptional board and exceptional advisory panel ambassadors. And we have an exceptional team and exceptional volunteers, chapter members, and just all of you, like the support that all of you are showing My Medicine Australia is, is incredible. We have like over 150 donors from large to small, like every dollar helps, do not underestimate that. And we just want to thank you for your belief in, in this. And, you know, Australia could actually become a leader in this space if we, if we just keep on keeping on. So that's very exciting. So without further ado, I'd now like to introduce Renee and Alana. Um, and, um, and they'll talk about the program. I just do want to say just what special people Alana and Renee are. Um, we brought Renee over from the UK to manage and, and design the Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapies. And Renee is not only a leading psychologist that um, you know, has an incredible track record in the UK, <clears throat> but she also worked on the psilocybin trials at Imperial College with David Nutt and Robin Carhart Harris and the other people there. So she she's like one of the best people in the world we could have brought to Australia to work on this with us. And Dr. Alana Roy, um, an exceptional practitioner, a social worker, and then now a, a psychologist. And she's just recently become a doctor, as in doctor of psychology. But um, Alana is exceptional. She's on the steering committee for our training program and is the practice manager of the psych services program that we have as well. And so you'll hear from both of them now. So welcome, Alana and Renee. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Right clap. It's lovely to be here to talk to you. And um, so the first part is about the program. And uh, to just add to the reasons that Tanya has already mentioned for why we need a program, um, I've outlined a few more points here. And the first one is that uh, what we really want to do is try and establish some standards for safe and ethical practice. A lot of people have been using these medicines in lots of different places, uh, some very good, but uh, some that we, we've heard of not so very good. And so I think it's really time that we start to set, set some standards. Um, not that I'm the one setting it, this is following an international trend. Um, so what we want to do, especially in the program, uh, is to bring together medical approaches, good psychotherapy, as well as the transpersonal aspects into one training program. 
The transpersonal aspects are incredibly important. They've been recognized as a key factor in promoting long-term benefit, so they have to be incorporated. It's a strange kind of combination now, but we you know we're in new territory. So the next point is to further the knowledge and interest in the, uh, in the change and the healing process generally, so to add to the body of knowledge. And um, finally, to provide training, support, education, and networking for the, those professions that are professionals that are already involved in the field. Yeah, the next slide, please, Elan. So how are we doing this? Um, the first step was to um, gather as much information as possible, talk to people, learn from the pioneers and the leaders in the field, um, MAPS, the CIS in California, USONA, New York, Imperial College, all of these programs where they've been doing research for some time now, training people to be participants in that research, and particularly the CIS who put together the world's first dedicated program for people in research, as well as for the therapists of the future in this field. And so um, the idea is to try and get the best from those programs and build them into what we're doing. So as Tonya said, I've come along and I'm very privileged to be able to do this. It's, it's, uh, it's so exciting, and very, very uh, interesting for me to be able to bring some of the knowledge um, from the UK and spend time putting this together into a program for us here. So the idea is going to be, we're going to establish a team of experts in the field to provide like teaching and lectures. So I won't be providing all the teaching myself, but, but drawing on the best of people that are willing to come in and run some of the webinars for us, contribute to the teaching and help with super supervision and all sorts of things. And then working with the steering committee just to make sure uh, it's very important to me personally to be able to bounce these ideas off the steering committee on a regular basis to make sure that we're on track and we're kind of meeting our targets and we're going to be able to produce this this course for you all in time next slide please Elan. thanks so what does a psychedelic therapist need to know uh, we have this lovely photograph from the johns hopkins um uh catalog really that we have permission to use and uh, it, it kind of shows the typical therapy uh, setup this is in the dosing session now it's important for people to understand that there's uh, if you don't know already that there's obviously a preliminary leading up to this point there's lots of preparation that people have to go through you have to uh, do lots of careful assessment and then after the session you you have to do a, a lot of holding people and helping them move on and helping them consolidate whatever's happened but i suppose the 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 crux of it really is this session that you have which is usually over the period of a whole day where two therapists will work with somebody who lies quietly with eye mask and earphones and uh takes the medicines and then um are you know sort of help to work with whatever comes up for them. Thanks, Elon. Next slide. So to incorporate uh, the knowledge that's required, I'm basically leaning quite a lot on the CIA's program developed by Professor Janice Phelps, and she has identified twelve domains of training. We're going to follow this very closely. Um, First of all, history of clinical research, the current legal status of psychedelic assisted therapy, then neurobiology, neuropharmacology, the drug dispositions, drug interactions. It's important to have that knowledge as well. Best practice in set and setting, preparation, psychedelic sessions, the integration afterwards. A very important part of this is the therapy component. And this is where I think it's, it's, it's really important for, um, I guess, the, to make the point that it's not just a case of giving the medicines to people, it's the psychotherapy surrounding the medicines that is actually the key component. Some people would say that's more important than the medicines itself. I think they're equally important, but when you're doing that psychotherapeutic holding, it's very important to know what happens when you do therapy normally, to know about the kinds of um, dynamics that arise uh, transference, projection, boundaries, all of those things that therapists are trained in, including ethics, and then also self-care, how to take care of yourself. Doing this kind of work can be very stressful on therapists, and they need to know what to do to look after themselves. They need to have done quite a lot of work on themselves 
in preparation so that they are in a good space to be able to do this. Um, there's a very strong component of uh, supervised observation of psychedelic therapy uh, videos, sessions, um, and uh, these are sessions where people are given permission for the material to be used. Um, there are also variations in the various therapy modes. People come along knowing for certain kinds of therapies. Those therapies can be applied, they might need to be changed slightly. Um, but the wisdom coming out of that body of knowledge of therapies is then also brought into the training. Next slide, please, Alain. Um, we know we need to incorporate complementary therapeutic techniques in psychedelic assisted therapy. This refer, refers particularly to the sort of somatic therapies, working with the body. This is something that psychologists are not usually well trained in, um, but very important because that component can play a, a very key role in what people are experiencing. Co-therapy methods, working with other team members, working in a setting with others, the therapy needs to be done in a team with two people, and there needs to be lots of liaising across the uh, different caregivers. The current models of consciousness, spiritual intelligence, mystical experience, it doesn't really matter where you're coming from in terms of what you believe, it's what how you can hold whatever this means for the person that's in that setting. Um, there needs to be some knowledge of ceremonial use of psychedelics in various religious and community settings. Then uh, the program in, at the CIS makes use of supervision for a period afterwards. People are able to, to have placements on trials and they uh, get supervision, get mentoring. And that is something that we're working hard to set up here in Australia where we don't really have many opportunities. We're hoping there'll be opportunities to have mentoring from people overseas as well. The last one, the personal experience of being guided as a research participant in an FDA approved study. This is what MAPS has, has managed to do. They've managed to arrange things so that the participants in the programs can actually have some MDMA and see what that's like. I'd love for this to happen for us, but it's not going to happen yet. We will work towards that happening. Next slide, please, Elan. Um, Janice Phelps has added uh, six competencies. These are characteristics that people have to be able to bring in personally that goes beyond uh, the knowledge. One is this empathic abiding presence where uh, it's to do with the, the person in the room. There's something about the quality of being able to listen empathically, being calm, having a calm effect, calming effect on other people, knowing how to respond to distress, all of those sorts of things. It's, um, it's a characteristic of maturity that, that comes with this. Secondly, enhancing trust, therapies, the therapist's capacity to enable people to trust. The spiritual intelligence, this may come from personal experience, some work you may have done uh, for yourself in this regard. There's the knowledge aspect, therapist self-awareness, clinical and ethical integrity, and then knowing about the complementary techniques. Next slide, please, Ilan. So we've based it broadly on the CIS. We've had feedback to say that Australians want this to be shorter. So whereas the uh, course in California is eight to 12 months long, um, we've shortened this to four months. We're still trying to fit in all of those uh, elements of the content. So it's going to be a very packed and busy course. Um, the, uh, for the future, as I said, we are going to try and get people uh, in a position to participate in whatever research will be happening in the country. And then we will work towards the um, experience of something for people. Next slide, please, Ilan. So here's the model um, of domains. Um, therapists from different uh, approaches are used to uh, integrating the domains of the thinking, the feeling, uh, emotional uh, aspects, physical aspect, the bodily aspect, and the behavioral aspect. So what I've done here is put those elements uh, on the one side for the therapist and on the other side for the experience or after the therapist. But at the top of both of these columns is about your own insight and your own spiritual experience, 
your own maturity, the work you've done on yourself. And then you're going to integrate your knowledge as a therapist, the deep inner work you've done on yourself, the somatic aspects, the um, physiological aspects, and then knowing what actions to take in the setting. So you need to know very much what to do if there's a crisis, how you're going to physically uh, deal with it. This moves on to, for the experiencer, gaining the feeling out of this of being uh, a tr a safe, trusting what's happening in the process, being well prepared, being open to whatever happens. And then afterwards, the task for the person is to take whatever's happened into their own lives, integrate this spiritually, um, process whatever mystical experiences they've had, take forward hopefully better knowledge, continue their emotional growth. And I think it's really key for us to think about how people continue with therapy after the process as they need it. They need to work towards improving physical health and then make real changes in their life. I think, um, sadly, when you look at some of the uh, programs where uh, you hear of people relapsing after perhaps a brilliant change period, a happy period, a well fulfilled, symptom free period, and then they relapse. My own theory is this, this is because they go back to life the way it was before, and it just reestablishes whatever it was that made them unhappy. So I think it's really important for people to make real changes in their lives following an experience like this. Okay, next slide, please, Ilani. So over four months altogether comes to 90 hours of live or webinar-based intuition, uh, tuition, I beg your pardon, with practical instruction. Uh, there'll be a lot of additional reading and self-study. Uh, before the course, we'll send everybody a reading schedule. Some of these will be classics. Some of these will be additional things to read. Then the core of the program, the heart of the program, are three intensives. It starts with a weekend in Melbourne where um, people have the opportunity to come along and do a lot of work on their own practice and have a look at where they are and where they need to move on. So it will cover a lot of basic material, but it'll be about relating this to their own practice. The middle weekend is holotropic breathwork, which is where people get the opportunity to um, experience something that does create an altered state of consciousness and uh, gives people the op opportunity of feeling what it's like to be cared for in a state like that and to care for somebody else. Um, the third intensive is a full week of um, practical learning. This is where there's going to be intensive coaching. There will be some working with videos. There'll be role plays. There'll oh be no, we're about to be late for a flight. Because, but that, but that first. Okay, there'll be feedback uh, of a direct feedback of learning, and um, it's going to be very intense with a, a lot of input from different people. In the interim weeks, the reading and the self-study weeks, this is what you do on your own based on the reading lists. The webinars in between, so you have an intensive and in between a week of, of reading on either side, and then a three hour webinar, which um, will be uh, consist of different people providing sessions within the three hours. So you won't be listening to one person talking for three hours. I uh, can't see what's at the bottom of the screen was lost there but I believe that's probably the uh, post-course supervision and mentoring, which we, we are going to be trying to set up for people well in advance of the course, so that you'll be able to go after the course um, and uh, have some supervised practice. But you'll certainly be able to join our psychological therapy services and join our supervision groups there and get some support from us. Next slide, please, Ilan. So eligibility, um, because the course is short, we're having to set the baseline fairly high um, because we're going to be relying on the learning that people come along with for us to kind of use that as a platform on which to build the other learning. So uh, it starts with a bachelor's degree in the field relevant to mental health. The reason for this is so that um, people come along knowing uh, what, for example, what, what PTSD is, what depression is and some of the principles of working with them. Um, 
they need at least three years of documented supervised practice in a mental health field. This is about knowing what it's like to sit with someone in a therapy space and work with them, knowing what to say. Um, the basic qualification um, also means that people come along with some kind of a history of professional practice. They will have had some qualification. Usually the body that they will be registered with will have a code of ethics and that will pro provide a, a kind of grounding for people to build on. Uh, we are interviewing everybody that's applied. It's a brief interview, but this gives us a feel for what the person is like um, before we make the final decision. Next slide, please, Elan. We've already set the dates for 2021. Um, these dates were set before we knew uh, about COVID, what that was going to do, and uh, clearly we're hoping that uh, the situation will be make it would be possible for us to carry on and keep these dates. If not, we can obviously um, consider moving the start date of the first course. Um, the data is all the information is all there. You can look this up on our website. We're in the midst of doing interviews at the moment. People can still apply and um, there's still time to apply for both courses. Next slide, please, Ilo. That's the end of me. So over to Alana. Thank you. Hello, everyone. It's, yeah, it's such an honour to be here doing this work and working with Tanya and Peter, Renee and everyone at Mind Medicine. And, you know, I, I personally know the power of these plants and medicines and, and professionally and I can't wait to connect with you all and build this vision around Australia. So I'm the practice manager of the psychological services and you know our goal is, is really to create a strong skilled and supported community that we can all be part of. We provide individual counselling through largely at the moment through Zoom but we do face-to-face -face consultations, group integrations by Zoom supervision, uh, peer supervision and individual supervision, as well as mental health, social work supervision, and in the future, uh, psychology uh, internships and placements that will that'll roll out in the future. We provide community education and advocacy, but a lot of, lot of social work students on the ground doing incredible work and uh, training and um, a Zoom study group, which has taken off, which has been fantastic. So for professionals to come together and review articles and you know, critically unpack things together. And we are all learning a lot from each other. It's been such a collaborative space. Next slide, Alan. So this is some of our team. We're only a small team at the moment, but we are expanding and as people complete the CPAT training, you will have the opportunity to apply to be a subcontractor and to also run group integrations. And we want to expand this team, you know, far and wide around Australia um, and state by state. So please, please make contact if, if you're interested and um, as opportunities arise, we, we will in involve you. Next slide. So Renee's covered some of this. This is with Janice Phelps' work, but the people that I'm really wanting to have in the psychological services team is, you know, people with that, uh, who are able to merge, you know, traditional and modern um, knowledge. That They've got the integrative theoretical frameworks to really hold clients who do this transformative work. And it requires really strong ability to work with paradox and darkness and to have strong ethics, to be reflective and to have really done their own deep inner work so that they can hold that space for others. And to also be able to engage with the mystery of life that we're all a part of. And I haven't got it on there, but the importance of humour and being able to work, you know, to be able to hold darkness and work with humour and, you know, the multiplicity of, of um, presentations and beliefs that can arise through these states. Next slide. So the criteria to be to apply to be involved in the subcontracting team, ideally we want people who have had legal experiences with psychedelics, um, so they've got that you know lived personal experience, or 
or other um, alternate states of consciousness through meditation or other other practices. But I'm I'm really looking for people who who um, you know are familiar with with the power of these perspectives. It can be a psychologist, a mental health social worker, psychotherapist, psychiatrist, a mental health nurse, GP, and any other allied health providers. And at the moment, we're looking at five years post-qualifying experience or three years plus the CPAT training. And for the current Mind Medicine um, members, you know, the expectation is, you know, within the next year or so that they will complete the CPAT. So to be part of our, our team, you will, you will have to have um, completed that training. You need to have your own indemnity insurance at the moment, your own place of practice in the future. Our, you know, our dream is to have more, more centres, but at the moment you need, you need to work in your own space and be engaged with an MMA chapter. And of course have um, all those checks and balances in place for insurance and working with children's check, etc. So please, if you meet that criteria and would like to be involved in a subcontracting team, please make contact with me. Next slide. So the services uh, we provide obviously are through um, mental health care plans via GPs, private health insurance ND and NDIS. So I've got clients under NDIS who are, it's all been approved through their plan to, to have integration support and private payments, um, preferably with, you know, with referrals. We're still wanting to engage, engage with the um, mental health sector mm -hmm. and practitioners have a variety of um, fees, so bulk billing and rebates, fee-for-service, etc. Next slide. So a big part of the work we do at the moment, um, given that, um, you know, we're waiting for these laws and processes to unfold, is the integration support. So although Mind Medicine is focused wholly on clinical uh, use of psychedelics, the psychological support service does work with people who have used these medicines in any capacity, because we're here to provide um, as much safety, mental health support and integration as possible, whether that is overseas or, you know, in recreational spaces. Um, and we do that obviously within, you know, all our codes of ethics and um, guided by our, our, our professions. So I really, really love this quote that after enlightenment comes the laundry. So you may receive 10 years of insights in one session. However, these insights require integration personal responsibility and action to get the most out of your experience. So, you know, our therapists are here for anyone in the community who is working with these medicines to help you, you know, really integrate and make, take responsibility, take action and, and transform your life beyond, beyond the session. Next slide. Yeah, just briefly, obviously, the, the, the themes that we work with, and I'm sure you all work with, is um, harm minimization, safety, self care, existential crisis, you know, assessing of spiritual emergence or, or psychosis, um, processing fear of death and, and existential anxiety, support to supportive space to unpack cultural conditioning, cultural beliefs, and norms, and preparing people for the psychedelic experience as, as people are. Um, gearing up for SS, SASB applications, I'm really helping them to prepare as much as possible their their life, their their mind, their body to undergo this process. And yeah, so we're here for you know the whole process, preparation, soon the the actual um, guided process, and then integration. Next slide. And our team is really diverse, whole range of different theories and methodologies. Um, transpersonal psychology, CBT, ACT, mindfulness meditation, mo motion focused therapy, EMDR, having incredible results supporting people with uh, processing some of their challenging psychedelic experiences using EMDR. And I really look forward to, you know, potentially expanding that in the research space and Jungian and integration therapy. I'm sure there's many more that we will add as we bring in more people to, to our team. Next slide. So I encourage you all to, to, to connect with us as we build this community. Join our peer supervisions. They're only $35 for an hour and a half on Zoom. Promote the group integration to your clients and down the track, once you've completed you know, CPAT, you can, you can run your own integration groups under the Mind Medicine banner. And 
the um, study group, which, you know, is a great place for us all to network and, and flag ideas for research and connect, you know, many of us work at universities. This can be used as a space to really grow the uh, psychedelic you know, um, scientific agenda. Our next slide. Before I hand over to Tanya, I just really wanted to um, just wish everyone, you know, strength during this time of COVID and I hope you and your families and your, your clients are safe and yeah, I look forward to working with you all soon. Thank you. Over to you, Tanya. Is that for you? I'm trying to unmute. Unmute. Good. Thank you, Alana and Renee. Um, fantastic presentation. Just so informative. Um, we'll come back to you very shortly. So we'll open up the chat um, again now, enable that. We also have had a number of questions that were pre-submitted, so we'll be coming to those in a moment. This is a comment by Tim Ferriss, which is worth reading. So he views the next five years as an absolutely golden window to use a small amount of money to impact millions of lives. And all of us can use not only money, but uh, wonderful hearts and are caring um, healing attributes, I guess, to, to really start to bring these medicines forward to the millions of people uh, who are suffering in the community today. Next slide, please. So these are some of the ways that you can help um, us to, to help you and help the patients out there. So starting conversations, sharing this information, I, we'd really like to encourage each of you who are on these webinars to bring at least two other people to the next webinar. So we have a wonderful new series of webinars and um, our network is growing all the time. We started off with, you know, no database a year and a half ago and we now have, I think, nearly 12,000 people on our database. So it's, it's amazing and we have lots and lots of people following us on social media platforms and so on. So I really encourage you um, to bring others to these webinars so that they can learn and they can get up the curve about the science behind these medicines. We also encourage those of you that want to know more to, to volunteer. Um, as I said before, joining our state and regional chapters and Thomas who runs the chapters is doing a wonderful job with them. Um, we have a wonderful learn section on our website and there's a lot of wonderful articles there, um, videos and other content that you can read and you can share. Um, obviously talk to, to other doctors. You know, all of you on this call are obviously getting up the curve already a long way um, advanced in your knowledge of this field, but there's always another doctor to educate um, or another few of them. So GPs and other allied health professionals, specialists, other psychologists, psychiatrists, psychotherapists, mental health nurses, addiction specialists and others. Of course, we couldn't do this without um, support, financial support, and um, we're very grateful to all of you who are donating to us. And just by a regular donation, it's amazing what a difference it makes. So even if you think that you can't donate very much, it all does add up. And following us on social media and sharing our content is also important. We also have a really important strategy that we're really focusing on at the moment, which is speaking to MPs, state and federal MPs all around Australia. And we're getting a lot of traction with that. And so it's really, again, just about informing people so that they understand the science and don't get caught up in the stigma. And then of course, there's opportunities to attend these sorts of events, other events that will start to uh, go live. So in some of our states where we have chapters, um, we can start to have more events occurring like in New South Wales and and other states. So we encourage you to attend the events as they start to re-emerge. And of course, the summit. So next slide, please. So this is a certificate. We won't go into this again. And the next slide is about the psych support services, which Alana has spoken about. And the next slide, which is about the summit taking place in November. Um, preceded by a two-day pre-summit introductory workshop program in psychedelic 
therapies, which has, is a great two-day introductory workshop. It's not only for therapists, it's also open to interested members of the public. We have a lot of people approaching us who are parents of kids who are suffering with conditions and just want to learn about this, this field. So we really encourage you to register for that if you haven't already. And as we've said, any registrations, if we have to move the event due to further lockdowns or anything, will be transferred to, to next year. Next slide. So this is the who's who lineup, incredible lineup of people um, who are involved in the summit at the moment. Some of them, of course, may not be able to come to Australia now due to the circumstances. Um, but we hope to get some of them in and we'll use a mix of technology and other clever um, interactive tools to make sure that we get the best interaction and the best experience that we can for everyone who's registering for this wonderful event. And the next slide. And this is the upcoming webinars. Um, so next, not next Wednesday, but the one after that, we have a really interesting webinar. Actually, it's not a Wednesday, that's a- Thursday night. A Thursday. <laughs> The Psycho Psychology of Psychedelics, A View from the Unified Theory with Greg Henriquez, who's one of the most interesting psychologists um, around. He's from the US. We're really lucky to have him um, doing this for us. And um, he's been able to, to work out through his unified theory why these medicines seem to have such transformational um, qualities to them. And I think you'll find that he's, his perspective as a psychologist um, with an expertise in unified theory is particularly interesting. He's a very thoughtful person. Um, the Psychology of Addictions, then on August the 12th with Patricia Slavuta and Dr. Dr. Eli Kotler um, should also be very interesting. And then a more specific session on addictions, um, looking at some of the, the medicines that are being used to treat addictions, psilocybin, MDMA, ketamine, and Ibogaine assisted therapies with uh, Dr. Nicola, uh, Nicola, I can never say Nicola. Anyway, the wonderful Dr. Nicola, who's on our advisory panel, um, will be presenting that one. And then on September the 9th, we'll be talking further about the SASB um, program and how we can all work together to make sure that more applications occur. In fact, we had a, a really interesting conversation last week with um, the chief pharmacist of the New South Wales state government and, and another key official there about this strange impediment that's in the New South Wales law. And they said, oh, you know, if there's, you know, a few, you know, a few hundred of these SASB applications, then we could be really interested in, you know, trying to fast track this. So. <laughs> Whatever it takes, certainly we hope to see hundreds of these applications starting to occur over time. Next slide, please, Alana, or is that back to the chat, I think, and now the Q&A? Yep, that's it. Back to the Q&A. So um, what we might do here is, um, hang on a moment, Let's go back to... Okay, um, I'm just looking through the chat, but what I'll do is I'll start off with the, I'll start off with some of the questions and, and Alana and Renee, when I ask the questions, if we can do quite fast answers, just so we can get through the, the volume, that'd be fantastic. So, um, this question, I'm interested in referral pathways for graduates. I know that Mind Medicine currently offers an integration service for people who've had a psychedelic experience. Will Mind Medicine support successful graduates by referring clients for integration sessions once adequate supervision requirements have been fulfilled? I think you already covered that, Alana, but just... Just, just quickly, after you complete, uh, complete CPAT, you can obviously choose to go out on your own and, and do your own work and private practice or you can, you can become a subcontractor under Mind Medicine and we will refer directly to you and be part of our team. So- um, Thank you for that one. Um, okay. This question is a bit broad. It says, considering the factors depend on the theme of the client's trip experience. However, please give a rundown on diffusing a violent or aggressive client or to put in festival terms someone who's having a bad trip. 
Alana, would you like to comment on that? Yeah, I guess when these uh, processes roll out, they will be within clinical settings and hospitals and clinics have emergency management, safety policies and procedures. Um, so I can't speak on that, you know, individual level, but it's within a clinical setting. So there's protocols in place. Furthermore, there's very limited, I guess, data to suggest, you know, violence with these medicines. Mm. It, you know, a bad trip generally means a deep, deep process and a highly emotional and confronting process. But, you know, generally everyone's, you know, safe. So, um, yeah, Renee, do you want to add anything to that in regards to safety? Yes, well, obviously, it's really important for us to make sure everyone's safe. And, um, you know, we know that when it's done in a proper clinical setting, that's what uh, is a priority is safety for people. Yeah, fantastic. Is there any examples, this is another question here, of things which you uncover during a session that is out of your jurisdiction and might need further medical attention or help? I, I can answer that. Yes, definitely. If anything to the fact that people need further support they would be referred on for that and be at we make very sure that they're safe until that happens thank and it's you so, so rare that, oh sorry that we will yes so both both guides in the room will need senior first aid certificate and a, a defibrillator on site um, and then extra medical interventions would need to be administered by you know a trained doctor that's if something untoward happened. Yeah, in the yeah it's all been the pro yeah. protocols and yeah, yeah. Uh, this is an interesting question. Is there some kind of ritual opening ceremony which you conduct at the beginning of a session with a client? To you, could you tailor it to the client's needs and add a bit of your own flair and heritage to it? Well, certainly that's great, great question and very important. Well, I think we've always respected where the client's coming from. So uh, in my experience, if people come along and they want to do a little bit of, you know, they can set out photographs of their loved ones or, or bring a special object, you know, to have in the room with themselves. And this is part of what you discuss with people in advance. What are their needs? And if that's what they need, we go along with it. Yes. I don't think we would as therapists even dream of imposing something on somebody else in that situation. It's all for their needs. Yeah, absolutely. I've got my... Uh my labradorite here <laughs> oh and my crystal quartz heart <laughs> i always use them in ceremonies um is there an exception to give the treatment oh i think this question is what um i'm really not sure what that question is actually asking it could be it could be what people are not eligible for these sorts of treatments I've got a feeling that's what the question is asking, but I'm not 100% sure. But we, we screen these people completely, all patients are screened completely, so you'll screen out anyone who's in the exceptional category. So I'll just skip that question for now because I think we've talked about it. Um, this is another one. Have any registered professional counselling organisations like ACA, PACFA and others been approached for any kind of alliance or working counsellor training arrangements. Alana, would you like to comment on that, please? Sorry, I was responding to the chat. Um, Renee, can you step in there while I... Um, not at this stage. I think that we're in a bit of a catch-22 situation, and that is you've got to have something to show them first. So I'm concentrating on getting the, the, whatever it is we have to show them. And then obviously we're going to liaise with these um, uh, bodies because we do want them to know what we're offering and to endorse it and support it in whatever way they want. Uh, what we do have is the agreement that uh, professional bodies will give you uh, CPD points for attending our course. But as I say to everyone who asks this question is we, we have to put the course together first before we can do anything. In some cases, you've got to run it first and then see what the first set of outcomes are. I think once uh, we get through that and I'm confident with, you know, uh, pitching it exactly the way it's being done in California and, and elsewhere, uh, we're on track to do that. Um, and yeah, and, and very excitingly, I think I can say this on this call, um, though it's not being confirmed. I hope Renee won't spank me for this, but hopefully she won't. But um, I do want to just say that um, there is a chance that we will have the key maps um, practitioners providing Zoom um, online training, which is really 
extraordinarily exciting. We spoke with Rick Doblin about this recently. And so it could be that Michael Midhofer himself is going to help provide some of the training for, um, you know, the students in this course, which is very exciting. I hope El Renee doesn't spank me for that. Renee, is that okay? <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Good. Um, and um, then there's other ones in the chat. So I'm just going to go through a couple of these in the chat now. Um, question here. Thanks for all the amazing work. It's a pleasure. Um, can you talk a bit more about the chapters and how they work? So the goal of the chapters is really to amplify what we're doing. So we're a really small team and we can't do all this completely ourselves. That's why we need volunteers and placement students and it's why we need chapters. So by having chapters, we can amplify the education that occurs in local areas, not just education of the general public, but also reach out to local MPs in the areas where we have chapters, reach out to local media. So to amplify the media um, awareness and get stories out there to amplify for patients and doctors and others the availability of these medicines. The chapters are also great for running events, so information education events, screenings and so on, and also for fundraising. So at the moment I think we have, Elan, how many do, do we have 30 or something like that? Now? Yeah, 32 chapters. 32 chapters. And there's some opening up I think this week as well. That's pretty exciting. Yeah, so that's pretty exciting. Um, so that's really taking off and we're, we're really excited about that. And if you're not in a chapter and you want to be, then please contact us. Um, next question is, hang on a sec. Um, I can respond to James's question around um, the reality, James, is the research is currently focused on individual psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and not larger groups. Um, what's that What's that question, Alana? He's wanting to know because it's going to take a lot of time to get this workforce trained up and, you know, is there, you know, will, will there be larger groups being, you know, doing these processes? So at, at the moment, the, the focus is on the individual psychedelic assisted psychotherapy sessions. I think, can I just say, I think one of the hopeful things here is that um, the actual uh, treatment of the medicines is, is shorter and there's an option maybe of giving people those individual processes for the actual medicines, but afterwards to join uh, groups for integration. Mm -hmm. Maybe a way to kind of uh, expand what we can offer people. Um, so this question from Stephanie about how people in Australia can access legal treatment. At the moment, that's through the SASB um, via referral from a psychiatrist. And if you don't have psychiatrists in your networks that you can refer to who are open to this or educated about this, please contact us. We have a list of psychiatrists. And as you would have noticed, Mind Medicine Australia has something like 16 psychiatrists on, adv on the advisory panel as well. So if you need psychiatrists who are open to this work, please contact us and we can make some introductions. Or, you know, I think Alana, you have access to that list as well. Mm -hmm. And also um, there's a potential for GPs to submit SASB applications with a psychiatrist supporting the process. Yes. So we're really uh, looking to connect with GPs who think are well. And specialist physicians as well, yeah. or addiction specialists. Um, and what about nurse practitioners? And nurse practitioners okay. in combination with psychiatrists. Yes, Alana? Yeah, yeah. That has to be supported by psychiatrists. Yes. Um, as a psychotherapist, how might I... Oh, okay. So that's what I've just talked about. I already offer integration. Da, 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 da. Okay. And certainly this is something that is going to be available, not just to clients in research settings. It already is, just to clarify that point. Uh, okay, so the question here about wanting practitioners to have a lived experience of the medicine and legal sense, how do they go about um, that access? Renee, would you just like to comment on that, please? I'm afraid that's a tough one at the moment because, um, you know, because of COVID, uh, no one's traveling, but the only way to get a, a legal experience is to go overseas. 
right now. No, but I'm, I'm more thinking about the fact that we are using holotropic breathwork, obviously, to help people. Yes. And well, we are also talking about um, uh, doing a clinical trial yes. to enable our participants to be, so that our uh, therapists to be part of a trial for healthy participants. That's what MAPS do. And this is part of what yeah. we're trying to, to get going. And it's a kind of, um, you know, not to give away all the surprises here, but it's possible that we can, we can manage that. And, uh, but I do think that people should have an experience of holotropic breathwork anyway, because it's a, it's a non-drug um, way of getting in, uh, into an altered state. And it's very powerful for processing physical sort of somatic components anyway. So yeah. yes, um, that is something I think is definitely to be str uh, to be aimed for. Would we accept a current student of psychotherapy into CPAP? Well, I guess if they they met other criteria that you had. Um, current student, I, I'm, I'm just a little worried about the level of experience. You know, depending on what other experience they have before. Yeah, to be yes. AA minimum entry point, and yeah. then build on yeah. that. Uh, I think talk to us if you have doubts. We're very happy to, to discuss it with you. And, and as I've done with people is perhaps give them advice maybe of a course or two to take before they come back and apply. You know, if they yeah. want to be on this pathway, we will help in whatever way we can. Yeah, wonderful. Um, okay, this question. How does the length of the sessions required when using psychedelics change the way therapists themselves manage providing therapy? Um, well, I'm afraid that's quite a long answer. <laughs> um, okay. Can you do a quick one or do you want to address that? Well, the training. <laughs> I think you're going to there's, be, there's hundreds of questions here. Yeah, yeah. I'll be very quick. I think you're going to be using most of the, of the, of the skills that you've already uh, learned as a therapist, which is why we want you to come along with that baseline of skill. And then it's a case of adding some, taking some away uh, in terms of what you do. And it's, it's so much more about the internal process of what's going on inside you, what you're watching out for when, you, when you're sitting with that person. And then how you, as a therapist, I find, keep track of what's happened there and pick it up afterwards in the integration sessions. And Janice Phelps also mentioned the, the practice of doing by not doing. So you're, you need a, a, a lot more capacity to hold and potentially not respond and not not intervene and, and to hold that space. So that's quite different than a standard one hour session. Okay, we have questions here too, but I think we'll, um, Luke, uh, Luke, you've got some great questions there, but um, I think we're gonna have to come back to these and possibly a supervision session might be helpful is, you mentioned clients following a protocol to prepare themselves for sessions. Can you go more into that briefly too? I don't think we have the time for that right now, but, yeah, would it be fine. good for Luke and others? Do they learn this in the supervision sessions, Alana? Um, it'll be touched on in the supervision session, but honestly, the short answer to some of these questions is join the course. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, if, uh, by the way, the, um, if role play is being undertaken in the training to develop competencies, do you envision this will prepare therapists for working with people undergoing psychedelic assisted therapy or do you think uh okay hang on or do you think no. there will be an opportunity to develop competency by training with people undergoing having trouble reading this question for some reason it's skipping do you see that one alana and david brun Or do you think there'll be an opportunity to develop competency by training with people undergoing the psychedelic assisted therapy later or down the approval pipeline, subsequent training courses? Do you mean, um, will there be supervised practice and opportunities to be involved in guided sessions once the laws start changing? And the yeah, and the answer is yes, of course. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and anyone who does this course is gonna be like totally ahead of anyone else, so. Um, Okay, there's questions here about eligibility. Um, can I suggest to those people who are asking about eligibility that, you know, just throw your hat in the ring, make the application. Alana and Renee are fantastic um, in terms of 
being very honest and, and giving you plenty of feedback. There's plenty of people here that sound like they have certainly got the qualifications required. Um, so we're not going to go into the details of your particular question right now. We hope you don't mind, but um, we really encourage you to do that. Or you can just reach out to Alana and, and Renee directly and they'll answer your question as well by email. Um, let's just see if there's any other quick ones. Okay. Okay, I think that's probably probably it. Um, if there's any other questions, you're more than welcome to send them in to us. And um, we will be very glad to, to respond to you. And we just want to thank you all for your ongoing support, uh, for being lifelong learners and, you know, wanting to extend your knowledge and, and support this incredibly important work. And um, we look forward to hearing from you. And please do bring at least two people along with you to the next one. Thank you. And thank you, Alana and Renee again. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Erin. Thank you, everyone in the team for your great work. And thank you all. Have a great evening. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.